talking about QBRs, right? Yes. So this is a process. Uh, I think I started doing this years ago at another company and, you know, definitely kind of coming off of mirroring what sales did um, with their internal like account reviews and account plans. And so we built out a customer success internal QBR process that worked really well. And I was thrilled to be able to bring that same program to client success. And so we're going to share today a little bit about how folks can get started if they're not already doing this. And if they are, maybe even think about new creative insights to share or new ways to, to organically, you know, run this program in their business. Awesome. Awesome. I know we're, we're having ours in a, in a couple of weeks. I can't yes. wait to, as a CEO, these are invaluable. These are so valuable to, to, to me to be able to really have a, a broad perspective of the business and be able to understand what is the, where, where, where should we drive uh, results and outcomes? And so I'm excited for ours and look forward to us, uh, hearing what you have to share with the group today. Awesome. Well, we will jump right in. So this actually, you know, all of my boot camps almost take like a very similar flow into how I structured the conversation and the presentation. This is going to mirror a little bit of like what we did last week. So if you were able to attend um, last week's session where we did um, the board decks, where I was able to kind of screenshot each of the slides so that you'd be able to kind of follow along on how I structure that conversation. We're going to do the same thing here with the internal internal QBRs. So I've already got a presentation prepared. Uh, don't worry, as part of the takeaway from today's session, you will be given my template for this as well. So you can go ahead and start using that if you don't already have a program like this in place. It's a great time for us to have this conversation because if you don't already do something like this, in your organization, you can start in December and gearing up for 2023. So uh, I think the timing of this is perfect and we're gonna get right in. So first I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page, right? This is not a customer facing QBR. This is a customer success QBR. It's an internal review that we're using to conduct. Uh, we're gonna do this on a quarterly basis here at Client Success. It's the same um, cadence that I used in a previous organization, which had great success. I've seen some people do it a little bit more frequently. I think, you know, depending on your business and, and how much bandwidth you have to run a program like this, you could adjust the cadence, but quarterly works well for us here. But this gives our team a great opportunity to really talk about their performance and their book of business learnings, as well as share with our leadership what their future plans are. And so because every CSM in my organization has a book of business, this gives us a really great opportunity to have a strategic level conversation and invite our executive team to that as well. So think about this and the way I've kind of pitched it to my team is like, this is your own mini board presentation um, internally, right? Because you're the owner of your book of business, and this is a great place for you to come and talk about how things are going, what's working, what's not, and really drive that reflection as well as your planning. And so it's a forcing function of doing a little bit of a deep dive, just like a board meeting might be for your leadership team. Um, but this is a great opportunity for all of your professionals in your business to really showcase what's, you know, how they're doing and what they're doing. So now that we're all aligned on what this is going to do and what it is and what it's not, um, let's jump right in. So First things first, I want to talk about how you're going to go about designing your internal customer success review. The first thing I put out there is that it's important to determine your cadence. Like I said, for us at Client Success, quarterly really feels like the appropriate cadence today. Um, in other organizations where I was, we did it quarterly as well. It aligned with how sales was running theirs. So sales and CS, we both did it together uh, jointly, which was really cool because it was same, part of the same motion of driving and fostering collaboration. So doing it together with sales was really cool. But like I said, quarterly had always worked for us. Now I have talked to some of my peers and I have some, some, some friends in the industry who do it on a monthly basis. Um, they find that being able to proactively look back a month and plan a month out, it was a forcing function of going deep into the data more regularly, but you've got to figure out what is the appropriate cadence for you, your, and your team. Um, like I said, for us, quarterly works just fine, um, but you might have a need to increase that cadence. So just figuring out what is appropriate. The next thing is you want to align on the data, right? What is what is going to be part of this conversation? What do you want your team to highlight? What are the things you want to go deep on? What are the things you just kind of want to talk about at a surface level? But aligning on what this story is going to be and what you want them to present on is going to be critical. Um, honestly, when you figure out this part, this is what's going to drive 
what kind of conversations you're having, also coaching your team on what the, what's the type of data they should be looking at and analyzing and bringing to the forefront. So you've got to figure out what is going to be kind of the core information you're going to have your team talk about in this forum. Um, I'm going to walk you through all of my slides so you will see exactly what I break down and what I have the team present back to our executive leadership team. So don't worry, I'm going to give you a sneak peek and little tricks on, on what to maybe focus your time and efforts on. But don't forget, every business is different, right? Your customers are different. Your product is different. Your teams are different. Your engagement model and strategy is different. And so what I'm going to show you today is an example of what I'm doing here at Client Success, which is slightly modified from what I've done in other organizations. So don't be surprised if what I show you today, you're like, oh, well, maybe I want to do this or maybe I want to do that or I want to do something different. Um, that's okay. Your business is different. This is really just a platform to give you some ideas and hopefully get you to embrace this program. The next thing you'll need to figure out is who do you want to attend? Um, when, Like I said, when I did this at a previous organization, we did it in partnership with sales. So this actually, this, this initiative was like a three-day um, program that we ran internally on a quarterly basis where we brought sales and customer success together. And everybody had a schedule of who was presenting when, sales went one day, CS went another day. Um, but who do you want to be a part of this review? Um, you have to think about it both ways too. It's not just who do you want your team to have access to and give them the platform to share their thoughts, but also who's going to be able to participate well from this, right? Who's going to bring good and engaging questions? Um, will your cross-functional team members benefit from this? I say yes. Um, so at Client Success, we have all of our function leaders um, attending. And I think there is just a really a lot to gain from that, uh, especially when, you know, as customer success professionals, we're always trying to foster collaboration. I think this is a really great place to start, right? Bringing folks in to hear from your team uh, and hear directly what's happening on the front line. So a lot of value there, but you're going to need to figure out what works for your business. Now, I'll tell you, at Client Success, I wanted to give my team um, kind of like a dry run. So the first time that we ran this was leading into Q4 and we just did it with our team because I wanted us to test out one, the presentation, right? How did we feel about the content we were sharing? I wanted everyone to have a safe place to do wonderfully or fail miserably, right? Nobody failed miserably. Um, but just to test out how they're going to orchestrate this and also a place for me to be able to provide them some coaching and feedback and say, you know, here's areas where we can go a little bit deeper or here's a place where I would include some customer stories um, or I wouldn't spend too much time here or, hey, don't read off the slides, right? We can all see what's on your screen. Instead, let's talk about what's underneath the data that we're looking at. So being able to provide that coaching and feedback created a safe place for them to hopefully now go into this conversation where we've got all of our leaders present. The last thing you're going to need to figure out is what's the structure, right? Do you want to make these sessions interactive? Do you want to leave time for Q&A? Um, how long do you intend for each person to have the time to present? So listen, our team, we're not 500 people. Um, so we're going to take the liberty of giving every person on the team an hour, but we want to make these extremely dynamic and engaging, right? We want the folks who are attending to be able to ask questions and dig deeper, seek clarity or seek to understand. And so we're giving them the, that ability with the time that we've allocated. And we believe that an hour is going to give them the the, the right amount of time to do just that. Um, that might not be something you guys have at your disposal. I know time is a luxury. Um, not everyone has a ton of it, especially with, I know we're all trying to do a lot more with less. Um, if an hour doesn't work, right? You could say, you know what, we're gonna build the deck, share it in advance. And maybe you just leave time and 30 minutes per person to do Q and A, right? There's tons of ways you can orchestrate this and still get a ton of value for both parties. Um, so that's what you're gonna have to figure out, right? Figure out what is gonna work for you. Um, our team, the way that we're doing it, we're breaking it over a course of a week and we're splitting it up. So we're doing a few each day. That way, you know, it doesn't, doesn't inundate anyone's calendar. We don't have to move a ton of meetings. Um, it feels like it's giving everyone the opportunity to participate. So this is what I mean. You get, you can get creative. You don't have to do everything in one day. You can space it out, um, do what works for you, but that's what you're going to have to nail. So if you're considering designing this program and starting to kick this off, those are the four things I would start with trying to map out, right? Figure out what cadence is appropriate, figure out what is the data that you want them to focus their time and effort around, um, who's gonna join, and then how do you wanna structure these conversations? So once you've nailed that, we're gonna get right into it. So now I'm gonna walk you slide by slide based off of what we're covering here at Client Success with our customer success team. So the first thing, and again, this is all made up data, so I just gotta 
preface that these are these are not real numbers. Just like last week, I had to go in, build a deck, put a bunch of numbers in there um, just to make these pretty and easy for you to follow along with. But the first thing we start off with is looking at the book of business. Every CSM on my team's book looks a little bit different, right? It's made up of different type of customers at different stages in their journey, doing different things with different needs, um, right? Different tenure in the partnership as well. So it's important for us to just all align on what is this individual's book look like? So this overview gives us context that we're gonna be able to use for the rest of the discussion. So that's why we like to lead with this, right? Have the CSM basically give us an overview of like, hey, here's what my book looks like. Now you're gonna have to figure out what is what does that snapshot look like for your team? Again, for us, high level, like these are appropriate things that we'll dive into, right? How many customers are you managing? What's the average ARR, total managed ARR, looking at the average success score against the business, um, what's NPS look like, um, how many customers maybe you have in severe risk, which for us, we use this as like a bucket of an indicator of like future churn. Um, and then breaking down like how many of our customers are at risk or satisfied. So for us, this is a healthy snapshot. For you, you might want to go a little bit deeper. You might want to see information that says, here's how many customers we have by segment. If you've got CSMs who aren't aligned to a particular segment, it's not unlikely that their book has customers that fall into different cohorts, right? What is their, their book of business look like from a health standpoint, right? So maybe outside of just looking at you know, at risk or satisfied customers, maybe you're going a little bit deeper and you're saying, you know, if we're managing a red, yellow, green health program, how many customers fall into each of those tranches? You might want to look at revenue bands and say, you know, this person manages revenue, like average revenue is between this and this. Um, you might want to look at revenue dates, I'm um, sorry, renewal dates rather, life cycle stages. So there is a multitude of things that you can include when you provide this overview or this kind of at a glance. Um, for us, we tried to keep it simple and high level. This is just an introduction to their book so that we can drive the appropriate conversation. So this is, again, this is going to be nuanced to you. You're going to have to figure out what your snapshot looks like. Make sure that your customer success team has access to these, these metrics. Um, that's the other thing, right? Don't want to make this too difficult for them to go and compile. Um, this should not take them three, four weeks to build this deck. If you got a template or if you choose to take mine, hopefully it's just slight modifications where they're just plugging in data that they have easily accessible. Once you get beyond the book of business, and like I said, this is a snapshot, you shouldn't spend a ton of time here. So even as you're thinking through where's the bulk or lion's share of our time spent, it shouldn't be here. Slide one, let them present this, talk about their book, and then quickly move on. The next thing that we're talking about is customer management. Now, for you, each of you, you might want to highlight different things here. When we think about this, we want to kind of understand how engaged are our customers? What are we doing with them? What are the types of programs that we've deployed? Um, so the things that we're looking at is, you know, in client success, we have a product called our Pulse, which is, I think, all of our customers' favorite part of our product. But it easily allows you to kind of set a customer pulse on a range of a six-point scale to say, here's how satisfied or dissatisfied our customers are. Um, so this we want to make sure that our customer success team are keeping updated on a regular basis. That ensures that our data is accurate and current, which with all data is critical. So we make sure that we look at, hey, do we have an accurate and updated pulse every 30 days with our customer base? In this little blue, light blue module, uh, I want to see what percent of their customers have had an updated pulse in the past 30 days. So for them, it might be, hopefully it's 100%, uh, maybe 95 but Give me the context, because this will help me understand the sentiment and kind of what we're working with with the book. Um, we also here at Client Success have a higher engagement model. This doesn't mean like we have a one-to-one -one ratio by any means, but we do want to stay engaged with our customers. And that engagement does look different for different customers. And it's based off of what they need when they need it. So for us, we're looking at customers who have been engaged in the last 30 days. Engagement is telling for us. Now, obviously, this is not a leading indicator by any means, but it really does help us to have a pulse on how are we doing in driving the customer's engagement with the partnership, making sure that they're using and adopting and getting value from the solution. So something we look at here is, you know, what percentage of your customers have we engaged with in the past 30 days, or in this case, customers that don't have or haven't had an engagement in the past 30 days. Now, listen, I also recognize we're going to holiday season um, and people's schedules change and availability is all off. So I do know and recognize that this number might shift a little bit during the holiday season. Um, but the idea here is that the team is staying engaged with their customers. We're also looking at things like their success score. 
So for us at Client Success, we're using our, our um, success scoring metric to say, you know, what percentage of our customers are below a certain threshold? Now, in this case, we're looking at it as a benchmark of 50, who's above or below the kind of like middle watermark. But you might, based on how your health score, your success score is structured, you might say, you know what, it's okay. We want to see anybody who's below 30. Um, and so you can figure out what are the right parameters for you, but we're looking at, you know, what does that kind of success score look like? Now, um, two weeks ago, I covered that success audit that we do with our customers. And so that's something else that we're looking at here. And the reason I share that is because if you were able to attend that bootcamp session, we talked about the value that that success audit is having with our customers who are engaged. And so being able to see where we've deployed that strategy and where we haven't, um, really helpful because we know that customers who have had this success audit completed, they're more engaged. There's probably going to be a residual impact of, of stronger, more thoughtful adoption of the platform, um, new opportunities for them. So this is an important thing for us to look at here at Client Success. Um, we also are using our scorecard, which is another part of our product that says, you know, we're looking at it right now um, as it correlates back to quarterly um, initiatives that we're doing with our customers. So if we've got all four of these boxes checked off, they're at 100%, which means we did all the things that we as a team agreed to do with our customers this quarter. Um, so we want to see how many of them at a certain point did we get to 100% versus how many of those are falling a little bit short. Customer advocates, huge outcome focus for us, right? We want to make sure that we are we are creating and cultivating a community of advocates, um, customers who are getting real value from the partnership. Um, and so we wanna be able to track that and be able to see that over time. So here we're looking at what percentage of their book makes up customer advocates. And trust me, we're not measuring advocacy through one lens. We know that not all uh, customers will be able to participate or show or demonstrate their advocacy through the same way. So we've got different ways to track that. And the last thing we're looking at here is customers and onboarding. Now, because we know that customers in onboarding probably require a little bit more time, attention, uh, strategic and consultative uh, support, we want to just be able to understand for our CSM's point of view, right, how many customers do they have at that stage in the life cycle, because that's going to be indicative of like where they're spending their time. So for you, this is what you've got to figure out, right? From a customer management standpoint, what are the things that will help you understand how your team is engaging and supporting your customers? Um, it doesn't need to just be metrics. It could be a multitude of things, but these are the things that we've decided to look at right now as we're just introducing this program. So think about this, think about the things that you think are going to be very telling to your book, and then have your team go ahead and present those engagement insights. Now we're going to get into the meat of it. Uh, now this is where you're going to feel, um, I think, a heavy sales influence. So again, stealing this from a sales, the sales team's playbook, what we do is we allow the team to look back at their renewal performance. So in client success, we have our revenue dashboard. So this would be a snapshot from there. Again, we're not asking the team to go and rebuild everything from scratch. We create these really, really easy um, templates so they can go and screenshot from our platform and drop right in and tell the story. So if my team is doing a look back, right? So let's just say we've got this, we're gonna be doing this program um, in December before the holidays kick off. And so they're gonna be able to look back and say, hey, here's the number of customers I had up for renewal this quarter. Here's how much ARR was up for renewal. Here's how much renewed, here's what churned, here's what the downsell was, here's gross renewal. Uh, here's where we had upsell. Here's what our net looked like. Now, again, all this made up data. So please <laughs> don't try to read into anything. But this is a great way for the team to actually go and tell their story. Um, even if your team does not manage revenue, they influence it. So just because they're not managing the renewal process doesn't mean that this isn't an important conversation to have. So regardless, if your team is managing renewals or if they're not, be able to talk about this. Um, I will tell you, I worked at a company many years ago where my team, we didn't own any re revenue, right? Customer success was there strictly as a value driver. And we worked with account managers who managed renewals and growth. And my team, even though we didn't manage that, we were still accountable for it. So we would always talk about what the renewal and retention and growth look like for our book, always important. So even if you're not managing that, this is a critical slide. This is going to be a great storyline for them to be able to talk through. Now, again, Please remember, the data is on the slide, but what you want to encourage your team to do is help tell the underlying story behind this. So what I want to encourage my team to do and what I would hope you encourage your team to do as well is not regurgitate what's on the slide. Hopefully everyone has two eyes. Uh, they can read it or they can interpret it, but 
be able to go and tell us what the data is, to have your CSMs tell you what the data might not be showing. So really, really helpful um, to just be able to get a lens like that. Now, I always say the devil's in the details. So it's great if I'm able to see what happened from a numbers standpoint. That's that's awesome. We all love numbers. But I love the stories. I love the context. I want to know why are customers staying? Why are customers going? And so have a slide that enables your team to talk about those storylines, right? You don't have to list out every single customer. I mean, especially if your team is managing a whole bunch, but be able to come through and say like, you know what, here's some of the important stories I want to socialize. Here's the customer's name. Here's why they stayed or here's why they churned and here's the ARR. And now this should just be a placeholder to facilitate that, that conversation. Um, they might be able to uncover themes patterns or at least give broader context um, to the, again, hopefully if you have cross-functional teams there to have that, um, right? I might be on the product team and I don't know, or I don't realize that our customers are leaving because we have this product gap, right? So again, know your audience because this will really resonate to, to really get people to see and understand things a little differently. And from the CSM's perspective, who's dealing with this day in and day out. Now, growth is also a big part of this. Many customer success teams right now are being tasked with owning growth, which is totally cool. But you want to make sure that you're being able to tell that story as well. Now, again, um, mocked up slide screenshot here from our client success platform. Again, we've got some really cool things that make building these decks really easy for us. But hopefully you've got access to cool information, makes it easy for you as well. What we do is we make sure that we understand number of expansions closed or revenue closed. Uh, it could be expansions, could be upsells, um, all of those things. So you want to be able to have your team tell their story, right? Like, how do we do from a growth standpoint? Um, again, even if growth is not solely the responsibility of your team, they're influencing it. So allow them to tell the story. It could be, hey, we did a great job supporting this one customer in this business unit. And because of the way our platform or our, our you know, solution is structured, we, our goal is to sell to more BUs in the company, or we're working with sales. And because we did so good with this company, we were able to get access to a parent company or a sister company, right? So you could start working on cross-sell strategies, whatever the case may be. A lot of that growth comes from the customer success team's ability to do their job well. So give them a platform to talk about how the work they're doing is impacting revenue. Right. There is there there could be like, you know, uh, a few lines of separation there, but that's OK. A few degrees of separation. It's OK. It is still a result of the work that they're doing in their day and being able to correlate their work to this level of impact is really powerful for your team. So regardless, if they own it, if they don't own it, it doesn't matter. What I want you to be able to do is empower your team to tell the stories and to, to feel some sense of ownership. Right. Even if they don't technically own it. Um, so give them that. Oh. Um, sorry, I was scrolling the wrong direction, folks. There we go. Okay, now um, going back to the details again, this is still a great time to go and talk about expansions that were closed. These are great opportunities also for the team to, to showcase and highlight some collaboration. Um, what I've learned in my professional career is that usually if you're growing an account, you're not doing it by yourself. You're probably working with a product team, maybe you're working with a sales team, or you're working with executive leadership teams, or a services or support, or maybe a different function altogether. Whatever the case may be, this is a great opportunity to do more of that storytelling. The data is wonderful, but these opportunities is really where your team is going to shine. So give a slide here that's an easy, quick placeholder where they can drop some details so that you can all visually follow along, but allow them to talk about what happened, right? How did we get there? Because I will tell you, most growth stories are not easy and they're not fought alone. So this is a great place for your team to shine and then also to shine a light on those that have helped them along the way. So create a slide here, makes it really easy, plug in some information. And again, these are one of those slides where I think you'll spend a little bit more time. Not like we talked about, right? The book of business overview, that should be like a quick kind of pass along. Um, but these, like, let this sit, let the stories um, really kind of resonate. This is where I would encourage conversation, dialogue, because this is where I think people are going to learn the most, because you want to emulate success, right? If something worked one place, it's a great opportunity to say, hi, this is how it worked. And this is what we did. Um, now you go, if you've got a similar situation, here's basically our new playbook of how we can go and do that. Um, give the team that platform to do it. Now, where would we be if we didn't give our teams opportunities to celebrate, right? 
Um, I'm really big on this. You'll notice here I say celebrations and learning is not like wins and losses or or failures or whatever, right? This isn't a negative experience for my team. I want them to celebrate really great things that they're doing. And I want them to know that their failures are opportunities to learn, right? In those moments is where we discover greatness. So for us, the way that we even position it is very specific. So celebrations. I want my team to be loud and proud about big things that they've done. And remember, not every win has to be tied directly to revenue, right? Just because I, I closed a multi-year deal doesn't mean that that was the thing I want to celebrate the most. For me, it could be, hey, I had a customer, you know, a very large customer. We had a new leader come in board. He had a preference of another solution. And so there was this immense competitive risk, but we were able to engage and educate. And as a result, he's a new champion of ours. And, you know, we had this big material win. The team's going to be using our platform. Yay. That's really exciting, right? And so the team might want to highlight something like that over just a revenue win. So make sure that when you're when you're introducing this as part of the conversation that you're highlighting for them that this is a safe space to talk about the work. Um, I've got folks on my team that own different projects and initiatives. There is one uh, customer success professional on my team. If you're a customer, customer you might be familiar with uh, Kristen. She goes by KGP. She leads our internal masterclass. Um, and this is really a, a webinar series that we have for customers only to think strategically about how they're using the platform and to highlight new ways to use it. So when she kicks off that program, which runs similar to this, right, like every quarter or so on, um, that's a big project for her. And so to, to be able to not only design and develop the content, but to lead these things just as I am right now, takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of dedication and time. And so if I was her, I would highlight that as a celebration. That would be a win for me, right? And not directly correlated to revenue. That's not the story there, but something that I'm really proud of and something that I think is having real impact on the business and our customers. So make sure that you're, you're providing some clarity around what are appropriate things to celebrate for the team and not isolating it solely to um, just revenue. Now, the other side of this is learning. I think this is a huge opportunity and I want everyone to always share their learnings because this is how you prevent making the same mistakes over and over, right? If I did something bad uh, and I have this cringy moment, I would tell everybody, be like, ooh, ooh, I did this thing and it really didn't work and I failed miserably, so don't do it or do it differently or if you're going to do it, just know what the outcome was. <laughs> um, so these learnings have real, real value to the team and I want to create a safe place for this where we can embrace it and celebrate it. Um, I actually heard somebody once talk about how like anytime that a team failed, they went and like rang a gong about a failure and celebrated it because it meant that they were trying something new, that they were stepping out of their comfort zone. So please give your team a place where they feel safe, not only selling, celebrating the great work that they're doing and the impact they're having, but also, hey, here are things that I've learned this quarter. Now, again, your slide could look very different. You can have a whole bunch. You can do one slide just solely on celebrations, one on learnings. For me, uh, I'm big on simplicity and less is more, so I don't want to do more slides. I have a layout here. We talk through their celebrations. We talk through their learnings. It's a great, it's a great way to engage that conversation. I will tell you, if you're attending, this slide usually drives the most conversation, most excitement, most collaboration. So you'll hear other CSMs jumping in when you're doing this slide because they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, um, that's so cool. I want to go try that. Or yeah, I made that same mistake. Oof, I wish I should have shared that with you. So you wouldn't have done that. Or thanks for letting me know I've got a customer in a similar situation. I didn't know what to do, but I know now not to do that. So there's a, there's a lot of value here. Again, make sure that you're giving them the forum to go and bring all of these things, like I said, celebrations and learnings to that conversation. Now, we want to make sure that we're allowing time for future planning, right? That's why these conversations are really exciting as well. This will give your team the ability to really show about, like talk about what's the future, right? So this is a bit of reflection. Let's look back. How did we do? What are we planning to do? So if you attended um, last week where I did the board deck, this is a similar feeling slide where we talk about the forecast. But for us, you would go here again, made up data. So please ugh, don't misinterpret or misread. <laughs> um, but you might insert client names, ARR, um, TCV, renewal dates. So just whatever details are important. Um, and then give like kind of here's where we're at, right? Like maybe things that we've lost, things that have already renewed. Great if you're getting in early renewals. Love that. Um, but then provide the forecast for the organization. This future outlook really helps everyone get aligned to what the reality will be. This is not an opportunity to um, 
sugarcoat and tell a story that doesn't feel real or accurate. We really want to make sure that you're, you're representing the truth and reality with everyone involved, right? Lying here doesn't serve anyone well. Um, I, I used to have folks that would sandbag their pipeline and say, oh, everything's at risk and only to come in really high and, and renew everything. And like, you want to get as close to reality as possible. Um, so this is going to be an opportunity to do that. Have them talk about their book. Now, listen, if you've got your CSM has hundred renewals this quarter, right? You're not going to be able to maybe represent all of those as individual line items. You might want to break those down into some other visual that works well for you and allow them to tell an underlining story. It could be, hey, you know what? Here's the movers and shakers, right? These are the deals we need to get in order to hit our number. If we don't get these in, here's what we can do to build to hit that target. So it really does give you an opportunity to kind of like build out your story to get to where you need to be. Um, but having this discussion is really the forcing function of uncovering where those gaps and opportunities are. Um, this also, again, allows for more collaboration. They can ask folks for guidance or help. Like, let's just say you've got a customer that's at risk, right? In this screenshot, my mock-up here, you've got some revenue that's at risk. That's fine. Let's have a conversation about it and talk through and say, hey, I want to, we want to preserve this customer. Here's what their objections are. What can we do? And maybe this is something where it's like the product is a gap or maybe their use of the product is a gap. Great opportunity for product to step in and hear that, right? Oh, okay, if we wanna preserve this customer and this revenue, here's a great opportunity for product to lean in and really understand what it would take from their team to help secure that. These types of conversations allow for that kind of distributed ownership. Now I know customer success is going to specifically own tasks and activities, but where this becomes really helpful is when you're trying to drive customer centricity in your business, you want everyone to have some skin in the game, right? You want everyone to have a sense of accountability when it comes to our, you know, our ability to hit those numbers or not hit them. It is not solely the sales team and it's not solely customer success. Your customers stay or go because of all of the work the company is doing. So if a customer is at risk or if a customer is churned, it is important to talk about that and everyone's got to own it, right? So this is a great opportunity for us to do that forecasting, work as a team to figure out how do we get as close to this as possible. Now, I also like to look a little further ahead. Um, my team does a great job of managing the quarter in front of them, but because we run our renewal process 120 days out, we actually even get further out than a quarter. So I like to look ahead. I mean, quite frankly, I feel like I have very little influence over the quarter in front of me anyway, because usually if a customer has decided to stay or go, that decision is made and I don't really have a ton of influence. But as we're looking further out, so in this case, if this is the template that we're using for December and my team is saying, okay, here's how I'm forecasting Q1, but here I can look out further and forecast into Q2. That could be a really great story there as well. So you can start to look at how many customers do I have out for renewal and what does the health of those look like? And what is that kind of distributed over that period of time? So really just a great opportunity to have those conversations st started. Um, it's going to be tricky to forecast, right? Because you might not already be far enough along in the conversations to definitively say this is coming in or this isn't coming in or here's where we're at. But being able to understand the health as you're looking into that future quarter, hopefully will allow everyone to rally around it and start to influence those outcomes. So this is really powerful. Again, the forcing function of getting my team to look a little bit further out because you can't always influence what's right in front of you. Now, something else you might want to consider or use, you can look at customer health. Um, this could be a breakdown of like, where do your customers stand, right? How many of them are extremely satisfied or very satisfied, barely? Where is their risk? How do you influence that? How did you manage it? So this could be really helpful spending a couple minutes just digging into their portfolio, understanding that the CSM might want to highlight a few customers. Maybe there's a couple of customers here that are doing really well, right? Like extremely satisfied. Um, these customers, they get it. They're using it. Ton of value, huge advocates. Great. Let's talk about that. Again, we want to emulate success. So if this gives us an opportunity to do that, that is great. Now, we might also want to talk about, hey, we also have some customers that are at risk. And here's what we're doing, and here's how I'm thinking about it, but great opportunity to discuss with the broader group. This is also a fantastic slide or placeholder to start talking about themes, right? So what are things that you're seeing pop up that are causing risk or driving success? I'm very big on that. I want to see patterns because patterns are going to help us drive those outcomes. 
Now, I also encourage the team to talk about, well, what are we doing, right? I don't want just theory. I want to know like, okay, if we've got a customer that's at risk, what are we actually doing to help get this, get them out of this situation? So allowing them a space to talk about their plans is really helpful. It also helps you see where and how they're thinking about things, but also to jump in and provide additional context, coaching, help, um, even from the broader teams who are attending, right? Again, sales might be able to see this and say, oh, well, okay, you've got this customer who's at risk. This customer only closed like a couple months ago. Well, what's going on here? They can see the story, but maybe they can help, right? So what you're doing here is you're giving the team an opportunity to really think strategically about how they're navigating the book, right? They're not accepting that the current state of their business is where it's going to live in perpetuity. The way that they are going to drive a different outcome for the business is to be able to start to plan and craft these ideas. So I don't need my team to come up with a very elaborate plan for every single one of them, but they're thoughtful enough to understand how to prioritize and where to focus their time. I always tell them, let's pick five, right? I'm sure that we could pick hundreds of customers who want to go deep on and build these plans, but for the sake of this conversation and this forum, five is sufficient for us. Now you might say, you know what, five is too much, Christy. Like we want to just pick top three. That's fine too. Figure out what is the appropriate amount of stories you want your team to focus in on and build. Again, it's just a great way to collaborate and make sure that you're addressing risk when you see it. Now, while I'm all about mitigating risk, I'm also here for the growth. Um, and so this is also a great opportunity if your team, um, whether or not they're owning it or not, right? They still collaborate, they're still accountable. Um, where is their opportunities to grow our customers? Now. Every organization is different. Your growth strategy is different. If you are on a pure licensing model based on employees, that's going to look different than if you are a modular solution trying to get your customers to use more. Or if you're a consumption model, that looks very different too. But I love this because it gives the team an opportunity to think thoughtfully about where can we grow the business. And so here, this is really important because I'm able to see, well, okay, great. Here's where they're prioritizing their efforts. Um, here's how we're thinking about capitalizing on this. These are the plans to get there. Again awesome place for everyone to jump in and provide their their contributions to the conversation also lean in and see where they can help um other csms might have ideas here too so i wouldn't i wouldn't limit the participation and collaboration only to the cross-functional teams or only to leadership you want to encourage everyone to engage a bit here um and so i always ask for all of my csms to to be active in the conversations as they're watching their peers present because for them they're going to learn things as well this is a learning opportunity for everybody but also a place for them to say hey i had a con i had a customer who looked exactly like that and we were growing in the same way and here's what worked really well you should try this if it's not part of your plan right so it's that level of like sharing and thoughtfulness that really helps to continue to drive things in that forward trajectory so spend time talking about growth plans as much as you're talking about risk plans um i love a pro professional development slide this is for for me this is something that i've always really enjoyed i think it helps introduce some accountability I believe, and I know everyone has different feelings about this, every company takes a different stance on it and goes about it differently. I believe that everyone owns their own professional growth and development. Um, as a young professional in customer success, when I got started, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to achieve, but I knew that I had to take accountability and I had to drive that. Um, and even if I needed or relied on leaders in my organizations or leaders outside of my organizations or executive coaches that I had, I knew that I had to be the driver of that and I had to own it. So what I encourage here is my team to talk about their professional development. Sometimes this is part of an overarching goal that they have where we can talk about things that they're trying to achieve. But I want to hear what are the things that they're planning to do this quarter to get there. Um, so I love this. This doesn't need to be a part of your, your, your deck, but I think it is really interesting to have the team talk about this, especially in that broad group forum. Now this last one, uh, I think this kind of anchors on something that is core here at Client Success, but that feedback is a gift. Your CSMs see things and feel things that uh, and hear things that not everyone is privy to. And so how I like to end this presentation is for them to provide feedback, feedback to the business. And so these are recommendations that they can provide to cross-functional teams or just general observations that they're making. It could be hey, listen, this process that we're using to do X, Y, and Z, it's not working or it's not working effectively. And 
I, you know, I tried doing this and it seems to work a little bit better. And so I'm making a recommendation here that we should probably pivot and remove steps two, three, and four and jump right to five and, and we'll be better off for it. This empowers them to contribute to the driving of the future of your business. And so you want them to feel ownership. You want them to feel accountability. You want them to feel a part of it. This is a great opportunity. But what I will tell you is if you do ask your team to provide you feedback, and to include these recommendations in your conversation, please do something with it. Just like you would close the loop with feedback to your, your customers, you're expected to do the same thing with your employees. So if your team makes an observation, I'm not saying that you have to go and do everything, but at least acknowledge that they've made that recommendation. And if it's not something you can do now or today, or if it's not a priority or it doesn't align with where you're at, it's okay to share that. It's okay to table it and say, Yes, not now, or yes, but let's do this, right? Um, but don't just have them provide this to you and then leave it out there. Um, make sure that you're taking it. And perhaps maybe after this entire program, you take everyone's recommendations and maybe you stack rank them, report back to your team and say, hey, everyone gave us such great feedback. It was awesome. You know what? We've decided that of the things that we heard and saw, we're going to prioritize these three things. And this is what we're going to tackle as a company this quarter. Thank you so much, right? Closing the loop with them. And it could show up in any different form. Heck, it could be a Slack message if you feel like that's appropriate. Um, but if you're going to ask them for that feedback, please make sure you're doing something with it. I bet you there are some real gold nuggets there for you to improve as an organization. So that is how we end our presentation as part of our internal QBR. Um, as always, I'm going to give you my uh, top five mistakes to avoid. So here, here we go. One, don't rush the process. Um, one of the things that my team hopefully uh, appreciates about this time around is that they basically have had the entire quarter to prepare for this quarter's presentation. These dates have been locked down. It's on the calendar. Everyone has it. They have the template. They can start building it as soon as they want to, as late as they want to. Um, but I don't want them to feel rushed, right? I'm not going to throw this on their calendar the day before and say, um, okay, guys, tomorrow we're doing these QBRs. Here's the deck template. Go. That's not fair right? You want them to be thoughtful. You want them to have time with this. You want them to have great stories. Um, and if you do that, you got to give them time. So please don't rush it. If you are not prepared to do it this quarter, that's okay. Get dates on the calendar for the end of Q1 and then be able to have those conversations as you're preparing for Q2. So please just give them a little bit of time there. Number two, don't keep the discussion isolated. Like I said, the first time I did this here at Client Success, it was a trial run. I was very intentional about just doing it with my team. But now that the team has an understanding of what's expected, how to run the conversation, how to build this deck, um, we're now inviting all of our cross-functional teams to participate. Um, I think that there is more value to gain when you invite others to the conversation. Um, so please, if you're gonna do this, do not keep it isolated to yourself. Please embrace your, your organization, bring the appropriate people in to, to be a part of it. Number three, don't try to get it perfect first time around. Um, I tell you guys this all the time. I'm going to give you a template. This is my template. This is what works for us. If you give it a shot and it, and it doesn't work, that's okay. Cool thing is you can iterate and make it different the next quarter. Don't strive for perfection. Just tr strive for progress, right? So do something today is better than not doing anything. So don't worry if you don't have it right, if something didn't work or uh, maybe logistically like, oh, you know what, we let it have too much conversation and we never got through the deck, right? So maybe timing and pacing was off, doesn't matter. Try to figure it out, just do something, it's better than nothing. Number four, don't prevent active dialogues. I find that the best use of this, just like you would do with a customer, right? If you were doing a customer business review, hopefully you're not the only one talking right? Hopefully it's an active dialogue with your customer and that audience. You want to make sure that you're creating that same environment for this, right? This is a business review. You're inviting the people to attend because it is supposed to be mutually beneficial. Please, if you can't allow for that active dialogue and it's only Q&A, that's fine. But whatever you do, do not let your team just prevent, present in silence and then walk away and say, okay, next. Um, that's not where you're going to get real value from this. This has to be an organic dialogue that drives real discussion that's going to drive the right outcomes. Number five, don't reinvent the wheel. I bet your sales team is already doing this. So if you are uh, a customer success leader today and you've got a sales team, 
check with them, ask them, say, do you guys do quarterly account reviews? Do you do quarterly reviews or anything, right? Um, I guarantee you, depending on, I guess, the, the, the maturity of the sales organization, they're probably doing this. So that's cool. Why don't you sit in on or ask to sit on, if you've not been invited to participate before, ask to sit in on it, right? And watch and learn and see what works well for them, what resonates, what doesn't. Um, honestly, you should be part of that conversation anyway. So it's a great opportunity to start to build some of that collaboration, but go watch what they do, see what they say, watch what they present and go take what they're doing if it's working and emulate it for customer success. Like I said, um, I've done this at a couple different organizations. It all looks and feels a little different every time I do it. I've got different teams, different makeups, different sizes, uh, different leadership, levels of leadership. So uh, again, figure out what's gonna work for your business. Um, but again, don't reinvent the wheel. Part of your takeaway from today's presentation is not only give you the recording, not only this deck, but I will give you the template so you can hopefully build from there. So that said, uh, I think we've made it to the end.